Hello class. Today we're going to be talking about what happens in development after birth. So when we start when we started we talked about how human development begins. It begins at conception with the sharing of genetic material and it lasts that nine month period through which they're growing in utero, which means inside the uterus of their mother. Now what's interesting about human development is that when we're born for lack of a better term, we're kind of like underbaked. If any of you are bakers, you put something in the oven, it's supposed to produce a development of that particular product to a certain level. When humans are born, i.e. they come out of the uterus, their development is lacking for, for no other term to use. The reason is, is that they have these giant brains. This is what we think is true, we're not sure. But these giant brains um, are really an adaptive feature that is extremely good for humans, but it's hard to get through the birthing canal. So because we're bipedal, that means that we walk on two legs. Um, there's some evidence that the hip structure of females can only be at a certain angle to allow for the passage of the head out of the birthing canal, and that beyond that it might be detrimental their, to their ability to to walk and run actually um, hips are designed for for running humans are meant meant to run we'll get to that when we do movement but the babies come out and their their big heads have to come through the birthing canal So the skull has to be underdeveloped. The skull has two big holes on it. The anterior fontanelle, that's the big soft spot at the top of the head, and a posterior one. A lot of times at birth, the posterior fontanelle is almost all closed, so not a lot of people know that there's a soft spot back on the back of the head, but they, they notice the one on the top of the baby's head. Uh, don't push on it, but uh, if you just run your finger gently over an infant's head, you can feel that anterior fontanelle. What's happening is that the bones are growing closer and closer together to, to eventually get into a place where they produce a, a fissure, a connection, a suture together. 
But that isn't allowed to happen because as the baby is born, its brain is undergoing massive growth in size, not in the number of neurons. In fact, the day you're born, you have more neurons than you'll ever have. So development isn't necessarily about getting new neurons. We do get new neurons in developed brains, but not very many, and we lose more than we get. So again, it's a finite resource and you need to be careful about your brain. When babies come out, they're not ready for the world. Um, I watched a giraffe be born at the San Diego Zoo once, and we got there in the morning, baby was just born, and it was just standing there, right? Just standing, like it was on wobbly legs. By the time we got back to it later in the day, it was walking around, nursing from its mom. Wow, I mean, this is, this is incredible, because a baby, when it's born, has a year a human baby when it's born has a year before it's going to be able to walk around with its mom and then not even very well. Um, humans are born underdeveloped, but we are born with some really intensely cool reflexive actions that enable us to engage our world and then enable our brain to begin to develop neural networks that connect and grow and make us capable of later adult behaviors. Um, so let's talk about some of those reflexes that we're born with. When babies are born, their um, sense of smell is highly developed. So typically when a baby's born, it's just gone through a big traumatic process and it wants to eat. And so oftentimes the mother, this is the best for the babies, is uh, places the baby on her breast and allows it to nurse or tries to get it to initiate nursing. This can be a complex process and um, women should be encouraged and helped by other people. There's something called the La Leche League and they're very good at helping women to breastfeed. This is a very important thing for babies because the best possible food for a baby is the breast milk of its mother. Because of the genetic connection to the child, her body has an immune system that is already well developed as an adult female. And so she has gone through this complex process of encountering pathogens in her environment, developing um, antibodies to things. and she, through her breast milk, protects that underdeveloped system of her baby. Um, there have been waves of uh, whether mothers should breastfeed or whether we should use formula. Um, nowadays, science pretty much is unanimous on this. Breast milk is by far the best thing for a developing baby's brain and immune system and overall health. Also, it promotes touch. And touch is one of those things that the baby's system is ready for. It's ready to be touched. It's ready to learn through touch. Its brain has not been developed well for the outside world's touch when it's in utero because it's just sitting nice and comfortable in this sac, amniotic sac filled with this warm fluid, you know, body temperature fluid. It's just been wrapped up in this biological blanket of comfort in there. Now it's gonna be feeling more harsh things. And so soft touch of the mother the warmth of her chest right after birth, you know, she's gone through an exerting experience, uh, is perfect for helping the baby to regulate its body temperature as well. The baby's born able to smell and to taste very well. And in fact, babies have been shown to be able to detect their mother's smell of the mother's breast milk of their own mother and to prefer it over other smells of other women's breast milk after an hour. Uh, after they were born. Uh, it's an amazing thing that they come able to do that. Also, they prefer sweet taste. This is why, evolutionarily, we have evolved, women have evolved to first develop in their breasts colostrum, and colostrum has a very sweet taste to the baby, which it's really pre-milk. Uh, it's not what the mammary glands produce as the natural food for babies, but that comes in later through a supply uh, a supply that's produced by the mammary glands of the female. Again, where we get the name mammal from is the fact that uh, mammals provide milk for their infants. That milk comes in later in a supply and demand scenario, whereas the, the baby who's um, nursing on her mother or his mother is going to produce a, a, a feedback loop to the woman's brain to continue to send hormones that produce uh, the lactation reflexes. Another thing that baby's born with are a couple other really helpful reflexes. One of them is called the rooting reflex. So if you have an infant around, this is a baby, you know, under three months or something, just 
stroke their cheek like this and what you'll see is they turn towards that. Or you stroke this cheek, they'll turn towards that. That's very helpful, right? So breasts typically are, are mounds and they have a nipple at the uh, distal portion, that's the part farthest away from the body. And what if there's a mound like this and the baby's head is against it, it will, it will reflexively turn towards it. It will reflexively turn towards it and as it gets to the nipple part, the mouth will be open. And so the rooting reflex enables them to turn towards the nipple without having a volitional sense of doing so. They're doing this reflexively. A reflex is like, remember, if you hit, hit your knee, that kicks out. I can't show you with my knee here just because of the camera, but that reflexive thing is you don't have control over it. And the baby doesn't have control over this, but it initiates movement. So it moves towards the nipple. When the nipple's placed in the mouth, there's a separate reflex. And again, reflexes are things that your volitional brain, the, the motor cortex, isn't in control of. And so the, when the nipple's inside the baby's mouth, it initiates a sucking reflex. It may take some time for your baby to learn to get his or her mouth around the nipple or latch on. When properly latched, your baby's mouth will cover your nipple and most of your areola, the darkened area around your nipple. Your baby's lips will curl out and his or her nose will touch your breast. You should hear smooth, regular sucking sounds along with swallowing. Let your baby nurse as long um, You can do this too if you stick your finger in a baby's mouth. Make sure it's a clean finger. Um, but you'll notice that the baby will, will suck it. And that is something that initiates the nursing of, of infants. And so these reflexes are adaptive in that they are going to help the baby develop a habit of nursing that then provides them with the sustenance they need. So that's the rooting and the sucking reflex. There are other ones, they're like the grasping reflex. If you put your finger in a baby's hand, it will grasp it and it'll hold on. This is because the baby's brain, when it gets the stimulation, will automatically do that in a reflexive action. It's not, the baby's not grabbing your hand because it likes to hold your finger. That happens later. But initially, it doesn't have the choice not to grip. And that is um, thought to be an evolutionary adaptation for when we, our bodies were covered with hair, that grasping helped keep the baby on to the mother. We don't know that that's true, but it's the best idea we have. And sadly, uh, a couple times I had to explain to mothers of old children who had had massive brain damage that when they put, you know, they're in the hospital with their child and they would put their hand in their, in their brain damaged child's a hand the the you know older person would grab and squeeze a hold of the hand of of the parent and parents oftentimes think that that means that oh they're there they know I'm here and they they love me which is a nice thing but it's not true what actually it represents is that the brain has been so damaged it's gone back to a level of infancy where it is reflexively responding to stimuli the decerebrate injuries are injuries that remove the cortical functions the sort of neural networking that we've done that happened, you know, and the experience I had having to talk to parents about why that wasn't representative of their child's conscious behavior. Um, this guy had been riding a, a motorcycle and he went over a bridge uh, and landed on train tracks and uh, his, his brain was, was scrambled such uh, that he was never going to get out of there and he died later. But the parents thought he was recovering because that grip meant, oh, he loves me, he knows I'm here. No, that grip means the brain isn't developed enough, or in that case had been, the, the development that had occurred had been removed through brain damage. Babies, however, when they grip, and like all these other reflexes, these are only initial reflexes. Like if you go to a two-year-old and you put your finger in its hand and it, it doesn't want to hold your hand, it's going to let go. See, that's the part of development that these reflexes are allowing for, is to do something but then to undo it depending on volitional movements. So that's the gripping reflex. A couple other reflexes that babies have when they're born are the Babinski. The Babinski is a fun one to mess with, which is if, imagine this is the foot of a baby. If you push near the toes and push, push hard on the sole of the foot and then go down towards the heel, the, the toes will curl in. Or you can't do this right away, right afterwards, just because you, you're sending signals um, for reflexive action and you can't just do it right away. Maybe do the other foot, push on the heel and push up towards the toes and what you'll see is those toes will fan out. That's the Babinski. Uh, another one is the stepping. So if you hold a baby under the arms and you, you put its legs down so that its body weight is pushing on the soles of its feet, then it'll, it'll, it'll do stepping. 
Now that's a, a normal reflex. Another one is called the Moro reflex, and the Moro reflex, you shouldn't do this unless you have permission from the parents, but it's, it's kind of fun. I, I did it with my babies. If you give the baby a sense of weightlessness, hold it under its arms, give it a little bit of a weightlessness feel, what happens is the baby will go, it'll spread its arms out and then it'll clench, clench in. And it'll do that with its mouth too. Uh, and that's the Moro reflex. Again, the idea is from an evolutionary standpoint, if the baby was dropped, felt weightlessness, and it went like this and then grabbed, maybe it would be held on to, to the mother somehow so that it wouldn't fall and be injured from that. That's our best theory about that. All those reflexes are gonna go away later uh, in development, way down the road, um, in your elderly years, there may be a revert, a reversion to uh, the Babinski thing. In fact, neurologists will check this in people who have dementia to see if they're, if they have some uh, Babinski, right? If you, if you go like that and their toes curl in, um, you might notice that the brain is, is degraded to a point where they're starting to exhibit r more of these reflexive actions again. So that's something to note. The brain is seeking out with these reflexes uh, the ability to do volitional movements away from them. So after about six months, you shouldn't be seeing any of these types of reflexes again. The sucking that occurs, the babies who are nursing are nursing now volitionally. They want it, and if you're nursing a baby, you know that they can demand it and they want it and they know how to do it. But what's happened then is that they have developed a system in their brain, a neural network that says, do this behavior and you'll get this outcome, right? It's a cause and effect. Babies are like little scientists and they're experimenting on the world. This is why enriched environments are so important for children. An enriched environment is one in which they're gonna be experiencing lots of different things. Most importantly, that they're experiencing that in relationship with their primary caregiver, their mother. Now I say mother, right? It could be their father, but it's very rare. But mostly mothers and also fathers. That's the best scenario. One of the weird things uh, about science is that it tells us inconvenient truths. And one of those truths is, is that babies do best when they are fully parented by both their biological mother and their biological father. We have some evidence from horrible things that happened in Romania in the 90s. It's not horrible that they outlawed abortion, but they did. And as a result, nobody had abortions and people still had unwanted pregnancies, which result in unwanted babies. And they gave them up for adoption and the Romanian government put them in these huge orphanages. Now they fed and they clothed and they changed and they kept them warm. They had nurses going around to all these um, cribs with all these unwanted babies. And they provided them with all of the necessary needs for uh, development but what happened is there were just too few of them. And so they couldn't do what was most necessary and that was touch, touch of the children. What they found is a bunch of these babies just died. They were fed adequately, they were changed, there was nothing wrong, but when they weren't touched, they died. It's an amazing thing to note that humans need touch so much that it could kill you not to be touched. So this is a really important thing. Um, later, NGOs, church groups, whatever, went into Romania with the permission of the government into the orphanages and sat there and people would fly out there from the States and just hold babies, just hold them. Because that touch, that connection to a human, that relational experience is life-giving. So remember that. Yeah, uh, we know that Touch is a very important thing. There was some research done by uh, some grad students, I think it was at Stanford, and they took rats and they separated those baby rats from their mothers. They fed them adequately, uh, but they isolated them so that they never got to touch any other um, baby rats or their mother. And what ended up happening, despite the fact that these baby rats uh, were fed adequately, had enough, you know, their cages were cleaned and um, they had enough food and water and warmth, uh, a lot of them just died, again, lack of touch. So touch is an imperative thing for a, a growing and developing mammal. We are social creatures and we need that level of uh, relational intimacy and touch. Mary Diamond and Dr. Rosenzweig at Berkeley did some incredible research where they put rats into enriched environments. Um, enriched environment meant that the rat had lots of things to do um, rather than just be in a cage by itself and do nothing, right? And this is a separate experiment, this is not the same one. But what they found is when they looked at those rats' brains, they saw 
the rats that had enriched environments had things to do, had other animals around, you know, toys and equipment in their cage, those rats' brains actually had thicker cortices. This was the beginning of our understanding of how the brain in a mature animal can grow and develop and sort of the beginnings of what is called neuroplasticity. Now neuroplasticity is, uh, takes over, a lot of people think that neuroplasticity means that your brain can, you know, like a starfish, if you cut a part off, it could grow more of it. It cannot do that. Do not believe that. But neuroplasticity means that your brain is a dynamic organ that's constantly in relationship to its environment, adapting and growing new neural networks. And in fact, those neural networks were shown to actually increase the size of the thickness and the layers, the cortices. Cortices is the top layer. Cortex means bark, and that's the top layer of your brain. So that was pretty cool stuff. Enrichment is really important for babies. Um, so touch babies, breastfeed babies, talk to babies, because we'll get to language development later. But those levels of touch are really important for them to go out of the reflex stage into a volitional movement stage. When babies come out, they have these haptic movements where their arms just kind of go around. They, sometimes they punch themselves in the face, but that's a learning experience. When they punch themselves in the face, they, ah, and they cry, right? They don't like that. They poke themselves in the eye. They don't like that. Their neural networks go, hey, remember that neural networking sequence that I just did? That behavior, punching myself in the face? I don't like that. So let's not do that again. In a learning experience, right, through trial and error learning, these haptic movements become volitional movements where they can reach out and grasp the things that they need. So that is the early stages of development.